Thank you, Pooja. Thank you, all of you. Thank you very, very much. It's, it's an honor to be here. I consider it a great privilege to speak to any group that can afford to have Leonardo DiCaprio as a cameraman. I think <laughs> I'm, that's really amazing, honestly. That you can do that's got to cost you a lot. <laughs> well, it's great. I hear they're changing uh, SIFE, Students in Free Enterprise, to something else. Uh, nobody called me and asked me, but I feel like that's a mistake. It's a brand everybody knows. I like it. I think you should stay with it, but there you go. Somebody, somebody else, somewhere else is making that decision, and so you will be the first people, whatever they change that to, this will be the first university to win the national championship yeah. under that label. Woo! So that's the Well, congratulations on uh, Fifth in the Nation. That's, that's remarkable, when, especially when one considers all the uh, universities, schools with all the resources and the uh, dimensions at their, at their command to make something like this happen for you to be able to, to compete at that level is absolutely wonderful. Congratulations and to uh, Dr. Green and all of the team, everyone that worked. Thank you very, very much. Uh, the first hire that I made when I came to this university was uh, Dr. Green. Uh, he was the first person that I personally hired. And, and uh, so I'm very grateful for the work that he's done on the College of Business and for all of the faculty in the College of Business and all of the students as well. Well, the title that I, I've been given to speak on is The Art of the Turnaround. I, I like the title for two reasons. One is I like the idea that there is art as well as science and uh, with regard to the turnaround. And secondly, the, the idea of a turnaround. You might just want to make a note of this. Uh, uh, in February, I have a new book coming out. It's called Relaunch. And uh, it will largely be a business and leadership book. I hope that you'll be able to get that. I, uh, it looks like now the publishing company, it's David C. Cook Publisher, is telling me that uh, we'll be able to get some advanced copies in January, so soon after school starts in January, I ought to be able to have some of those here on the campus. I hope so, so we'll see. Uh, but it, it encompasses some of the ideas that I want to speak to you about briefly. What I'd like to do is speak to you and then take uh, questions. I don't promise to have any answers. Uh, it, takes, uh, it takes speakers that are more confident than I to call it a Q&A, because that presupposes that they have answers. I say Q&R, because that is, I simply promise to respond. <laughs> the response may be, beats the heck out of me. So, uh, but I will uh, give you uh, the best response I have at the time. Now, let's talk some about uh, the art of the turnaround. First of all, what is a turnaround and when is one required? A turn, let's just take the word turn. In every company, business, department, division, university, organization, church, family, and life, there are those moments where a change in direction has to happen or a change in speed. So you might say that the company might not have a turnaround, but it might have, a, you might have to turn right or turn left. That's a change in direction. You might have to turn it up. Maybe, it's, maybe the velocity is too slow. Maybe you need to, to turn the heat up. That's a turn. Maybe. Maybe it's cooking too fast. You have to turn it down. Dep irrespective of what you think about the efficacy of the Fed, uh, that, that is supposedly what the Fed is supposed to do. That, that if, the, if the economy is, is overcooking, then the Fed acts to turn things down a little bit. If the, if the economy is lagging, then the Fed's supposed to take action to, to help it uh, cook up a wee bit. So, I mean, at least that's one of the things the Fed is supposed to do. So there are all kinds of, all kinds of things that, that would determine a turn. 
There, you might need an, a turn in terms of, in terms of uh, customer relations. You might need a turn in, in terms of internal customer relations, how the colleagues in your organization treat each other. So there may be all kinds of things that would cause the necessity of a, of a change, and that change has to be led with intentionality. So the first thing that has to happen is you have to know what the real situation is and what has to change. Institutional reality is not always passionately desired and pursued. And a part of that is simply because, uh, frankly, we don't want to know. Uh, we don't want to know uh, how anything that's wrong, anything that needs to be changed. We don't want to, if we know it, we have to deal with it. Once you see it, it's your responsibility. So it's simply easier to ignore it. The second reason that people don't want to know institutional reality is that they, they're afraid that they won't know what to do. So, the, the, so it's just a lot of times easier to kind of, uh, it's what I call magical thinking. That somehow or another something will happen. There will come some moment, some thing. Uh, unfortunately, in the church world, and I know a lot of people take offense with the word magic, but in the church, the church world is rife with magical thinking. And uh, they, uh, they use the terminology, religious terminology, a miracle will come, I'm believing God, something like that. Uh, but but uh, it, it still is, is holding out hope that something will happen. We're 40 points down. There's two and a half minutes to go in the fourth quarter, but a meteor could hit the other team. And, uh, and then, you know, and we expect a miracle. Um, so that's, uh, that's the kind of thing that also hinders institutional reality in the religious world. I, uh, I took over as the senior pastor of a, of a mega church in Orlando, Florida that was bankrupt in every way that you can measure bankruptcy. Uh, it was morally bankrupt, emotionally bankrupt, relationally bankrupt, and economically bankrupt. Uh, there had been nine years earlier, there had been a, a sexual scandal, then nine years of declining enrollment, and declining, or declining attendance, declining membership, declining revenue. Uh, during that period of time, the pastor had a sort of field of dreams mentality, build it and they will come. And somehow or another, he convinced uh, a local lender to lend him $21 million in the midst of a nine-year decline. And they built a 5,000-seat auditorium that uh, when, uh, when I use the phrase... Uh, spared no expense. Let me just say to you that he lent a whole new grandeur to the phrase. The lobby was lined with uh, massive slabs of imported Italian marble. Uh, there were uh, escalators that went up from the um, main lobby up into the auditorium, uh, one coming up and one coming down. I struggled with the biblical implications of that. Um, <laughs> underneath, the, uh, underneath the orchestra, there was a hydraulic lift so that the orchestra came in at the basement level, started playing, press a button, and the orchestra would gradually rise, filling the auditorium with music. That at least was biblical. What shall we say then? But he that ascendeth must first descend. And... <laughs> <laughs> there was, it caused the project, the loan, and the declining attendance and enrollment caused so much anger in the congregation that they resented the building. It was rammed down their throat and, and they resented the building. It was also pushed through the uh, Orange County um, civic organizations, licensing, all of that kind of thing. I will go into all the ways, but it was, it was rammed down their throat too, so Orange County resented the whole building. Uh, and finally, they got upside down, the, and the bank, uh, listen to this phrase, uh, the, the borrower is the slave of the lender. You need to hear what I'm telling you. If you get upside down in that, it's, it's seriously true. So they forced the resignation of the pastor, the bank forced the resignation of the pastor and required the church to get a new pastor. They called, reached out to me, and I had a psychotic breakdown and accepted. Um, and 
So the first thing we had to do was know the realities. What was the reality? So I did a systems analysis of everything. What was working? What isn't working? What isn't working and it doesn't matter? What isn't working and it does matter? What, what bridges have burned down and need to be rebuilt? Which ones need to be ignored? Which ones need to be delayed? What about the educational system? What about the discipleship system? What about the worship system? What about the economic system? How much do we really owe? To whom do we owe it? How do we pay? Those things all have to be analyzed and they have to be analyzed rapidly. My first meeting was with the uh, loan board of the bank. It was highly aggressive and extremely confrontive. And uh, frankly, I will tell you honestly, I, I, was, I was shaking in my boots. And they, they said, we don't want to hear anything spiritual from you. They said, all we want to know is, are you the man to save this church? Now, that's an offensive question to us, isn't it? Because we know that there's only one man that can save that church. But that boardroom on the 17th floor of the bank building is not the place to explain theology. <laughs> I'm sitting across a mahogany conference table from eight or nine members of the regional loan board of a huge bank and a banking system, and they said, we want to know one thing. Are you the guy to, are you the guy to s save this church? Can you turn this church around? Because they said, we need you to understand the board of this church can vote you in, the congregation can vote you in. You're not the pastor till we say you're the pastor. So answer the question. So I said, yes, I think I'm the guy to save the church. I think I know what to do. I have the experience, the expertise. I think I understand what the problem is. I've analyzed the systems, and I think I know what to do. I think I'm the guy. I think I have the leadership skills, the communication skills. It's not the time for humility, true or false. You understand what I'm saying? When you're trying to sell something, i.e. you, that's not the time to say, you know, no, no, I don't, poor, no, I'm ignorant and stupid. Um, but I'm just trusting God, you know. That's not the moment. Are you, are, can you all hear this or do I need, how religious do I need to be with this group? I don't, oh, you're business people, right? <laughs> Theology majors. <laughs> Theology majors, you have to take a whole different approach. <laughs> so I said, I can. I said, but I've got a few questions for you. I said, uh, who got fired from your bank? That's what I want to know. I said, what nincompoop was asleep at the wheel when you loaned 21 million bucks to a church that had been declining in membership, revenue, and attendance for nine straight years? I said, I want to know who you fired. I said, furthermore, don't jerk me around. I said, if you want this building, tell me. I said, you want a unipurpose, limited building in a blue-collar neighborhood in Orange County, Florida. I'll give it to you right now, and I'll take the 1,200 people that are here and we'll go down the road and go into a building and I'll start a debt-free church. If you want the building, tell me. I'll give it to you right now and walk out. But I need you to know I'm leaving here and I'm going across the street to the Orlando Sentinel and tell them that your bank forecloses on widows and churches. And I said, so tell me what you want. And that bank, the head of that loan board, folded his hands on that big mahogany table and he looked at the colleagues to his right and to his left and he said, well, by God, boys, we got a preacher here that can talk business. <laughs> I need to tell you in all honesty, when I got in the elevator to go down, I was so sick to my stomach. I thought if those guys knew how close they came to being vomited on. <laughs> I, my, literally, my knees were shaking when I came out of there. That's, that's how close it was at the beginning. So the first thing is institutional reality. And how much reality can your followers, constituents, employees, how much can they hear? How much can they stand? That's, that's part of the intuitive art. You, 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 the, in, in a sense, you had to take that Muhammad Ali approach. <laughs> Float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. But you've got to know when. <laughs> 
There's a time when you got to float in there nice and kiss people on the cheek and tell them daddy's home and everything's going to be okay. There are other times when you got to break their nose. And, and you got to know which is which. And so I made a list. I called a church-wide meeting. Uh, I know 1,200 people. Those of you who grew up in little tiny churches, you got 30 people in a double wide somewhere in Dubuque. You're thinking to yourself, boy, I wish I could have such a bad church. I had only 1,200 people. But remember, I had a 5,000 seat auditorium and a $14.7 million debt. So 1,200 people in a 5,000 seat auditorium looks like the funeral of a very unpopular man. <laughs> and, and it had about the same spiritual dimensions too. There, they, I mean, you scatter 1,200 bodies across. There were days I could have shot a shotgun in there and not hurt anybody. <laughs> so I made a list of uh, PowerPoints, debt. We were, we were 120 days behind of the vendors. 120 days behind our vendors. I had to go like a... Like a a beggar, I had to go to Florida Power, I had to go to different vendors, I went to Florida Power and said, if you turn the lights off, you'll never ever get paid anything because we're finished. If you will be patient, I'll pay you everything that we owe and we'll never be behind again. Do you, do you understand how humiliating that is? That you're going around, you're the pastor of a mega church and you're going around with your hat in your hand trying to say, be patient, I'll pay you, I'll pay you. you it's, it's like the the poor family afraid that the take back man's coming for the car every night. And I'm the pastor of a church that's a mega church. So I made the list of all the financial information, the CFO and I, the, the church financial officer and I have made all the, the different things. We put them all together. I called a church wide meeting, business meeting. Everybody that's interested in understanding where the church really is, please be there. Magical thinking had set in. The previous pastor was, I'm not trying to tamper with anybody's theology, so everybody hold tight. But he was rigid in an over, in, in an over extrapolated version of um, kind of a confessional faith. You know, that if you say it a certain number of times, it'll, it'll happen. And so he believed that if you gave a bad financial report, you, weren't, you were operate, not operating in faith. So that year after year after year after year, while they're hemorrhaging to death, he's telling everybody everything's okay, everything's okay, everything's okay. So how do you break that news? How do you start to deal with that reality? How do you bring institutional reality to that? So I called a church-wide meeting, had all, all the PowerPoints set up, everything like that, and I told the security guard, stand by the light switch. And when I snapped my fingers, Turn the lights on. So I just started through in a nice calm voice, just like I'm talking to you right now. I just started through. This is where we are. This is our cash position. This is what we owe. This is what we have in the bank. This is what's on the books and not in the bank. And anybody understand what that phrase means? Are we, are we communicating? So I started through everything like that. Just went through it. And all of a sudden, from out of the dark in the back of a 5,000 seat auditorium, a man yelled at the top of his lungs, oh my God, we're bankrupt. <laughs> Lights. So I said, okay, we are. We are bankrupt. But I said, I've met with the bank. I've met with lenders. That's when you have to say, that's the institutional reality. Now, here's the art. Daddy's home. <laughs> Daddy's home. I know what to do. We're all okay. God is with us. It's not magical thinking. God is with us. We're going to make it through. Everybody hold tight. We can make it. But we can only make it if you know these three things. Where we really are, that we still have hope, and that God is with us. So I'm going to tell you the truth. Every single time, I'm going to tell you the truth. Institutional reality, then. The second thing is restoration. What has to be restored are two things. People confuse these two words, and they're not the same at all. What has to be restored is you have to restore trust, and you have to restore confidence. Trust is about character. Confidence is about competence. 
So you have to restore the team's confidence that they can win. In a, in a turnaround, quickly set up some short-term wins, roll up some short-term wins, and celebrate. I don't know if you've read Leading Change by John Cotter. Anybody? No? Oh, brethren, <laughs> I believe in John Cotter. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John Cotter. Uh, <laughs> Leading Change by John Cotter. Uh, he, says, he says the same thing. Set up short-term wins and celebrate. Okay. Look, you take over a football team that's gone... 1 in 12 for each of the last six seasons. Don't schedule Ohio State for your home opener. <laughs> schedule Slippery Rock and kick the living daylights out of them. <laughs> and then go to your alumni and your constituency base and on television and say for the first year in seven years, we won our home opener, 47 to nothing. Don't tell them that you were playing an NAIA school. <laughs> and last, uh, the last seven years they opened with Ohio State. Don't we schedule the home opener and we won. Set up a short-term goal and win it. And then celebrate like you just won the World Series. What does it do? It restores confidence. It restores confidence in themselves and it restores confidence in you. Then connect the dots. Now listen to Dr. Mark on this. Connect the dots between what you taught and the victory that you won. Now, that seems dreadfully immodest, doesn't it? But the fact of the matter is, people will not always connect the dots. So you help them connect the dots. Because I told you this, and you did it, this happened. I learned this in coaching. So you're, you're coaching a 315-pound tackle whose shoe size exceeds his IQ. <laughs> so you say to him, no, no, look, Leroy, if you will go, if you will go this way, if you will just do what I'm telling you, you will be able to hurt this boy. And I want, I want you to hurt him. <laughs> no. See, you're blocking him, but you're not damaging him. So if you will only do what I say, so the first time that they carry the other player off on a stretcher, then you call Leroy to the sidelines and say, now you see, because you did what I said, he's not going to be back in the game. <laughs> that, you see, you've connected the dots. What does that do? Who can tell me? What does that do? Trust. He trusts what? He trusts what I told him. He has confidence in the skill set that I taught him. Therefore, what? The next time, you see what I'm saying? So connecting the dots is an upward cycle of the restoration of confidence in themselves and in leadership. Leroy is the same guy he always was. Now he has confidence in his ability to hurt people. He has confidence in your ability to coach. And the team is gaining confidence in their ability to win. The restoration of confidence. The second part is harder. That's the restoration of trust. That has to do with character. That has to do with transparency. When I came to Old Roberts University, we restated three years. Where are the accounting majors? None? None? They're, I'm not asking you to confess to anything. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> th th you understand what I'm saying to you then? We restated three years. I had, I had a big four accounting firm on this campus basically full time for a year. I paid $850,000 in accounting fees because the books were so messed up going back. I finally just said to Ernst and Young, how far back? What do we do? They said, you can't, you can't fix decades of books. They said, just go back and draw a line and say, okay, from there, it's right. From there, it's right. Why? Because I wanted that EY good housekeeping seal of approval. I wanted that on my books. We had to restore the trust of the alumni. You have, to, you have to hit the road. I went to alumni meetings from Dan to Beersheba <laughs> and just let them vent. I, I found alumni that were scattered, that were angry, 
And depending on the decade in which they attended here, they were all angry about something else. <laughs> Some of them were angry because Oral Roberts had the unmitigated gall to die. Some were... <laughs> Some were angry because of who followed him. Some were angry because he got fired. Some were angry because he wasn't publicly executed. Some were, they were so what do you do? You just walk in there like a big boy and take it. And, and don't show response. You just let it happen. And then you begin to act in integrity. You begin to display the books. You put, your, uh, you put your 990s online, you begin to do what's right, you begin to act in such a way, not just to restore confidence, restoration of confidence is about getting the right kind of enrollment going, getting the right wins happening. That's restoration of confidence. What you gotta do is restore trust. Are you gonna lie to us? Are you gonna steal from us? I came here, we had $15 million in temporarily restricted funds that were on the books and $100,000 in cash to back it up. <laughs> we're bankrupt. You're, oh my God. Oh my God, we're bankrupt. Thank you. <laughs> Today, I want to tell you something. Today, Tuesday, our board meeting starts. And I will report to the Board of Trustees at Oral Roberts University that we have $30 million in temporarily restricted funds on the books and $30 million in temporarily restricted money in the bank. The people who, to whom you are accountable have a right to know where everything is. Where everything is. Is it right? Is it correct? That is what, and gradually that restores trust. Whether it's a marriage or a friendship or whatever it is, when trust is broken, it's broken in a moment. It's restored in a process. So, the guy who lies to his girlfriend, then he says, I won't ever do that again. Do you trust me? She should say, well, no. Uh, I love you, and I want to learn to trust you again. But the last thing you said to me was actually like you see a lie. So work with me. Give me time. Rebuild my trust. Rebuild my trust. Do you have confidence in me? Oh, I do. I have confidence in you. You're really good at your job. You're a great provider. All those things. But it's my trust that's been damaged. I'll tell you what really helped me, I have to keep track of my time here. What really helped me when I came here, I brought in a consultant, um, a lady that had also done a consulting job for me in Florida at another university. And she said, she said, Dr. Elton, everything that I do for you can come down to one sentence. She said, if you will listen to this. She said, what got damaged here was not the systems or the money or the finances, it was the dream. She said, what ga got damaged at ORU was the dream. She said, you can put the money back in the bank, you can fix the books, but she said, what's got to happen here, the dream has got to happen again. So that becomes then the art of leadership. What do we, what do, we do to restore the, the culture? One of the top 10 I, I think maybe the top, if, if I'm not here to lecture on the 10 functions of the CEO, but one of those, the CEO is the senior culture officer. The, the, the culture of ORU was damaged. The, the faculty had sued the previous president. You, can you feel that that was nervous to me? <laughs> you, you can see that, right? I mean, I'm walking in. What I found was that the faculty was waiting to love the president. They were ready to embrace a new president. I thought they were just waiting to sue the next guy. <laughs> but if the fact of the matter is they were waiting. You know the two things that I was the most scared of in coming to ORU? A 61-year-old president of a previous university. You know what I was the most scared of? Two things. The faculty and the students. <laughs> 
I, I, I wasn't scared about the finances. I wasn't scared about other things. I, I had a terror of walking into chapel the first time, unknown, unloved, uh, not in a bad way, not, not hated, but not, uh, not having a love relationship. I'd spent 10 years building up karma at another university. Now I'm going to walk in the platform and I had this nightmare. This will reveal the insecurity. But I had this nightmare of making a joke or something that had worked elsewhere and 3,000 college students going, oh my God, <laughs> what have they done? I mean, I could see that. Do you understand what I'm saying? But the other nightmare I had was walking into the faculty meeting and being served with papers. <laughs> Are you Mark Rutland? Yes. <laughs> Here's your warrant. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 and, and neither one of those things turned out to be true. The, the restoration of relationship, the restoration of vitality. So I walked around this campus the summer before I, school started. I got here before Pooja and that group came. I was, so I just walked around an empty campus. I walked into an office. President's office had been deserted for 15 years. It looked like a uh, it looked like a post-apocalyptic steakhouse. There's dust everywhere. There's no chairs. Big, thick, heavy wood coated in dust. Everything like that. And, and an empty chair sitting there. And I walked around this campus, and I prayed. I said, what? what? God, give me something. And it just kept coming to me over and over and over again. Joy, 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 joy. So all I could hear, joy. So one day in chapel, my first semester, I, to this day I don't have any clue why I said it. It must have just popped out, the Lord, whatever. I just said, welcome to the most joyful university in this or any parallel universe. And somehow or another, it just clicked. And now there are people all over the world who know we're the most joyful university in this and any parallel. I get letters that are addressed to the president, and they get it all wrong. They get it wrong to the president of a parallel universe. Says, no, 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 no. They see it on TV, you know. Oh, I love the parallel universe. They think that's the name of our show. <laughs> So yeah, th there's, the, there's the, the restoration of the dream, there's the restoration of hope, there's the restoration of trust, confidence, competence. All of that has to happen. Now, let me just deal with the word art for a moment, and here it is. This is the, this is the thing that I can't teach and nobody can teach. Your exalted faculty can't even teach you. And here it is. That is intuitive leadership. And you don't need me to give you permission to do, learn, or master anything. Nobody's looking for my permission. But somehow or another, you will have to find permission as you mature in leadership to, to, to move in that strata of intuitive leadership. In coaching, you come to a crisis moment, 30 seconds left to go in the fourth quarter. You're down by one point. You've always run this one play to try to close out this one play. And all of a sudden, you just think, that's not right. That's not right. That's not right. I don't know how to tell you. I don't know how to teach it. I'm just telling you the chief executive officer has got to be, if it's 99% if it's 99% business and 1% art, I don't know what the percentage is. But, but there's that nimble, light on your feet, easy moment where you gotta know when to tighten down, when to loosen up, when to, when to tighten all the bolts, when to let it rattle, when to speed up, when to slow down. And, it, and it's the hardest thing in the world to master and, in the, and the hardest thing in the world to teach. But just to say to you that, the, that that's part of it, the art, the art of the turnaround. Well, I've talked longer than I meant to. Now we have about 20 minutes. Questions that beg responses. <coughs> yes. 
So you often talk about how um, it's difficult personally to be um, the leader in a turnaround situation because of all the emotional stress. Can you tell us a little bit about how do you deal with the time when you know, you're know you up top, you're lonely, everyone's not understanding, it looks difficult. How do you keep motivating yourself? How do you keep Good. wanting to do what you're doing? Good, good. Look, this is the advantage of teaching or talking about business and leadership at Old Roberts University of, say, Michigan State. And that's this, that the Lord, the Lord is my strength and my shield. And, and the darkest, the darkest, worst time in my life since I received the Holy Spirit was the time when I let my life drift to the surface of leadership and accomplishment and ignored the internal. Like a balloon that you just keep getting fur further and further out and the surface stretches thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner and it's all on the surface. So you keep adding stuff to the surface and keep adding stuff to the surface. But there's not, there's not enough inside to sustain. And you know that the, you know the explosion's coming. So I, I would say to you, in leadership, in every position in life, tend to your inner person. Good. Tend to your inner person. The second thing is you need friends and people that you can talk to and share with. And, you, and if you are married, some level of, of intimacy about the, about the issues you're facing in, in your life and in your work. But this flies in the face of prevailing. What I'm going to say to you is very controversial. What I'm about to say right now is controversial. You, as a leader and as a spouse, you have to be a little bit careful who you bleed on. You go home and vent on your wife. This is horrible. I hate this place. I all that kind of stuff. And you're venting. You're just venting. You're just getting it out of your system. But the problem is she's taking that in. Yes. You go home and tell your husband, I, I hate every person at that business. Okay, you, you, now you feel better, ladies. But your husband is taking, he doesn't want anything to make his wife miserable. So you're okay in the morning, but he hates, he hates anything that makes you miserable. He's shaken. Your spouse is shaken. Parents who bleed on their kids. Be careful what you talk about at the dining room table. And, on your, and bleed on your employees. And I, I'm going to tell you something. I, this world, your generation, loves to talk about transparency, transparency, transparency. I have to tell you something. I think it's highly overrated. I think you need to be transparent with God and with your most intimate friends. And I think there's a bunch of stuff you don't need to tell anybody else. And I, and I think you tell the wrong people and you can do a lot of damage. I mean, you're talking about transparency in the pulpit. You don't want to pretend to be Superman. I've never done that. I've told you. I've talked to you honestly in the pulpit. But you don't, you don't want a pastor who walks into the pulpit Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. I'm so depressed. Oh, my God. I don't think I can preach today. <laughs> I mean, right? How many Sundays would you stay? Or be transparent. People say, be transparent about the troubles in your own marriage. Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Well, me and the old woman really duped it out last night. <laughs> There's got to be a way in which you deal with your own inner life, your own self. You and God and your spouse. So there's a part of it that has to be leadership. Somebody, the projection of energy, the projection of life and vitality. I, I've studied great leaders and I believe that one, one variable that I've seen consistent in so many of them is the projection of energy. There's just something about when the man walks in the room, the lights come on. And you can be tired, you can be fatigued, you can be depressed, all the rest, but you can't just pour that out on everybody. You've got to be able to know when to pour it out on God, how much you can pour out on your spouse, none of it on your kids, very little of it on your employees, even your closest colleagues. But you've got to have somebody somewhere that you can talk to. And, it's got, and, and you've got to have that intimacy with God. Even fatigue. I have to tell you, you be so tired you can't even think straight. And you've got to step in there and do the deal. People say, wow, you always seem so energetic and on top of it. Isn't God wonderful? You go in your office and you say, oh, God, I'm dying. 
Well, you ask a simple question, you get a novel for an answer, but you know, I think you touched a nerve. Okay, I'm not helping. I'm not helping anybody here tonight, but I feel a lot better. <laughs> Getting some stuff off of my chest. Who else? I hate that awkward moment where you realize you've confused an audience so bad they don't even know what to ask. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the church in Orlando. Yes. One off I four. Yes. Down by I drive. No, on I four, right in Winter Park. Oh, in Winter Park. Right on I four, <laughs> Calvary Assembly of God. Oh, really? Yeah, it's what the, the traffic people, you know, the traffic copters and all that, they would say, okay, there's a tie-up. used to hear them, they'd say, there's a tie-up at Church World. You know, everything is world, Disney World, Sea World. So they called Calvary Assembly Church World. It, it, it was their idea of a joke. It wasn't funny to me. <laughs> Who else? Yes? Um, what are some books you recommend us to read, like, if we're trying to advance also, like, in our leadership ability, what are some books that you suggest? Well, I mentioned Leading Change by John Cotter. Um, in, starting in February, you should read Relaunch by Mark Rutland. I think I'm, no, no, golly, golly, don't laugh at me. Uh, that's ugly. Uh, let's see, um, what are some other things? Um, I... I um, I like John Maxwell's books. Um, the John's a friend of mine. Uh, his, uh, in my humble opinion, some of John's earlier books are better than his later books, and and it's not always you're not always able to tell the difference. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, I'll send you a bibliography. <laughs> See, you old dudes all have the same stuff. That's <laughs> Who else? Come on. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, what are your, I'm going to call out one of your tweets here. Oh. <laughs> no, you don't throw a man's words in his teeth. What is it? What did I say? Something what stupid. You said leaders who cannot see themselves as servants will not be seen as other or by others as leaders. Yes. How do you maintain servanthood while leading? Good. What a wonderful question. Next time you ask me back, I'd like to lecture on on uh, servant leadership, which is really one of my favorite topics. Look, it's it, the matter of servant leader is in the is in the matter of the motive. It's a matter of the motive to make the right decision, no matter what. To make the right decision, no matter what, because you are concerned for the constituency, the people that are implicated, even though they may not like it, you have to. Somebody has to make the decision. Somebody's in authority. So let me give you an example. Most of you are unmarried. Anybody here? Anybody here married with kids? Anybody here married with kids? Okay. So here's a guy. Here's a guy who's watching the last game of the World Series. Okay. So Atlanta Braves. And the New York Yankees, the last game of the World Series, the Braves are ahead by one run. It's 3-2 on the last batter, two outs, the bottom of the ninth. The Braves just need one strike, and they win. But there's a Yankee on every base. You can put any adjective before the word Yankee that makes you feel good. And, there's, <laughs> and, and the pitcher just needs one strike, and the Braves win the World Series. And the dad looks, and the five-year-old Johnny is playing with a priceless Ming vase that his wife inherited from her great-great-grandmother. And he says, now, Johnny, put that vase away. You know you're not supposed to have that. Daddy's watching the ball game. And he turns back to the ball game, and smash! The vase is gone, destroyed. Now what does the guy do? Turns his TV set up, jerks Johnny up, and spanks him all over the house. He says, I'm giving him a biblical spanking. Isn't it biblical? What does the Bible say? Spare the rod and spoil the child. Isn't that what it says? Sin is bound in the heart of the child, but the rod driveth it forth. I'll just paraphrase scripture on that. The rod driveth it forth for a little while and then cometh again. But, <laughs> but the problem is the father thinks he's giving a biblical spanking, but the problem is you cannot con a kid. Johnny knows exactly why he got the spanking. He didn't get the spanking because he played with the vase or broke it or disobeyed his dad. He got the spanking because he dared to be inconvenient. He got between his dad and his priority, which was the ball game. 
Now, what is servant leadership? Johnny's playing with the vase. You say, look, there's no reason in the world for a five-year-old to be playing with a Ming vase. That's not a proper toy. Why would you be doing that? It's because you're bored. So let me take that out of your hand and put it up high where you can't reach it. And you run upstairs and get your bat and ball because the real world series is in the backyard. Let me turn this TV set off here because the Braves will figure out some way to lose this anyway. So let me turn this, <laughs> let me turn this off. Now that's a command decision. That's leadership that is made at a sense of self-sacrifice for the good of constituency. Is this making sense? Yeah. So on, in the upper room on the last night of Jesus' life, do you think anybody was uncertain about who was in charge in the room? Everybody was clear Jesus was a lefet, right? But what did he do? Got down on his knees and washed feet. Mayenti and this. Do you understand? That's servant leadership. Servant leadership is not being obsequious. It's not some kind of Uriah heap thing. It's you can be the boss. You can look. I'm not touting the Greens, but David Green, the owner of Hobby Lobby, let me tell you something. I don't know if you know this. What, do you, what, do you, what is minimum salary in the United States now? Yeah, David Green's minimum salary is several dollars an hour over the federal minimum salary. He said, I said, that's, you don't have, that's not minimum salary. He says it is at Hobby Lobby. What is it? I think $12 an hour. Do you remember? He's up over 10. I didn't know. Over $10 an hour. I said, that's not minimum salary. He said, the federal government doesn't set my minimum salary. But he didn't set my minimum salary. As a result of that, <laughs> turn to your neighbor and say, no union. <laughs> the union comes in, we're going to get minimum salary for you. Then somebody yells, get a rope. <laughs> no, but you, you care for your people. Doesn't mean you're not the president or the leader, or the boss, or the supervisor. It goes to the issue of, of, of servanthood. Six minutes. Way back there. What do you do about those who, regardless of all your efforts, you can't restore their trust or gain their confidence? All right. It's a big boy question. You ready for a big boy answer? Here it is. There are some people that cannot make the journey with you. There are some employees that can start the journey with you and cannot finish. Loyalty to your employees is a virtue. But allowing discontent, malcontent, rebellious, and inefficient employees to hinder the, the organization or the success of the others is not a virtue. There comes a point where you have to say, Bob can't make the trip. Bob can't make the trip. If you like firing people, you don't need to be in charge. If you can't fire people, you don't need to be in charge. There comes a moment where you have to be able to say, Bob, you can't get your attitude right, you can't get your skills right, you can't get your trust right. We've done everything we know to do. I believe you're a valuable player, but not on this team. Somebody needs you, and I'm going to prepare the way for them to find you. <laughs> so that's, that's the fact. That's the fact that some people just aren't going to make it. In terms of your broader constituency, that deals with employees. In terms of your broader constituency, you cannot heal people. I can't heal people. Alumni, students, people out there that, you know, uh, it's, listen. Somebody's going to be mad if you draw your next breath. Yep. It's hard for you to believe, isn't it? Everybody in the world ought to love you. You're so perfect. But the fact of the matter is there's somebody that is hoping that the sun will come up on you tomorrow. You wake up cheery and happy and sunny and ready to go tomorrow, and they're mad at you and God. Now, you need to settle that in your mind. And you can't heal them. You can't heal them. Listen to this. The train rolls through town at two in the morning, and the little dogs come out of the yards and bark. Do they stop the train and chase the dogs off? No. The train just keeps going. It's always going to be little dogs. Let them yap. Do the right thing. 
Get your inner self right. Lead with courage and with compassion. But there's going to always be somebody that's so wounded you can't fix them. And it isn't your job to fix them. That's God's job. Good question. I worry sometimes about talking to young people that I tell you things that you don't need to hear for another 10 or 15 years. Everybody okay? I can, you know, I'm talking, I can see it in your eyes. I, mean, I will never work for this guy. Yes? Uh, as a leader, other than people being a sense of accountability around you, what's another way that you can hold yourself accountable as a leader that you're doing the right things as a leader? Well... I, what I like, everybody has their own style of leadership. There's adversarial advocacy. Uh, I like uh, consensus building. So I work with a with uh, vertical tiers, uh, and I have it every place I've ever been, of expanding levels of influence and, and information. So I have an executive staff. Executive Vice President and Chief of Operations, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, Provost, um, ex uh, Vice President and General Counsel, and um, Executive Vice President of uh, University Advancement. They're, they're my central core of information, decision making. I like working with them. Go down to the Vice President's Council. Vertic vertically on the other, there's the Dean's Council, which Dr. Green sits on the Dean's Council. I like having access to people to make decisions, information, things that they know. I don't have to know everything. I'm not an, ac I'm not an academician, really. I mean, not really. I'm a preacher and a businessman. I'm, I'm not really an academician. But I, I can hire academicians. I can have a provost, Dr. Fagan. I don't have to know all the nuances of HLC realities. I, I can hire Dr. Fagan. I, I'm, not, I'm not an accountant. I can hire a controller. But you have to hire really good people. You have to listen to them. The second thing is I believe in consultancy. I don't know if you all teach about that much. I, I don't, anything I say that, that they haven't said, they're right. Um, <laughs> But I, I, when there's some particular project, reality issue, I like to bring somebody in from the outside that has no agenda and, and pay them to tell me what the situation is. I, I, I have done consulting and I like consultants. I, use, I probably use consultants more than most university presidents. Uh, and then you need a reportage with a board. And we have an independent board of trustees at Oral Roberts University in every organization I've ever worked in. So you have to report to the board. So there's your accountable line. Okay, is that helpful? Okay, one minute. Ready? Anybody? If anyone has one last question, that's all we have time for. Dr. Ruffin, why are you stepping down? Why am I stepping down? <laughs> for 25 years, in three separate places, three separate states and locations, uh, I, uh, I have been in highly intense, high octane, high velocity, high altitude turnarounds. The budget here this year at ORU is a $100 million budget. It's the first time in ORU's history, even when Oral Roberts was here. I have 600 employees. I'm one of the largest employers in Tulsa County. The university is in good shape. It's growing. We have the largest freshman class this year since 2003. 76 countries, 76 new international students, I should say. Excuse me. We're reaching internationally. I love it. It's great. I, I would like, I'm also 64. I feel that I, I, I know that I know what it's like to be young and look at old dudes. I know, I know what I look like to you. I, I don't fool myself. But I feel that I still have some youth and energy. I, I, I have some things I'd like to teach, share, write, preach. And, and I, I want to not be in the highly intense atmosphere of the chief executive office. And I, I would like to do that while I'm still ambulatory. 
<laughs> and, uh, and so, if, if at all possible, I asked the board last September a year ago, I said, will you find a chief executive officer over the next two years? So I've done one year, I have one more year, and then I, I would like to move into some more creative type things, writing, preaching, teaching, conferences, leadership, consultancy, this kind of thing. I, I, I would like to do this. Somebody said a consultant, uh, somebody said an expert is somebody from out of town with a briefcase. I own a briefcase. <laughs> I have a briefcase. What I want to do is travel around and tell people all the stupid mistakes they're making. I'm tired of making my own. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you, young lady. Thank you.